very common for video game developers to hide rooms in their games. A lot of the time, the rooms are never meant to be found by players and serve as test rooms for various functions that are being implemented into the game. Other times, the rooms exist as elaborate easter eggs hidden by the developers for those super detail-oriented players to discover on their own. But one thing's for certain, developers don't expect most players to see these rooms, and in some cases, developers specifically didn't want players to ever find these rooms. These are the secret dev rooms in gaming. Let's look at Halo, because there's a lot of examples in the Halo franchise we can use to start with in our investigations. Like, for example, in the very first Halo game, there was an easter egg where if you're playing on Legendary difficulty and you killed keys in the first level, a bunch of these really strong invincible marines will come running into the room and essentially won't stop until Master Chief is dead. But if you manage to get past them without dying and make a run for this back room where the marines came in from, this room otherwise isn't accessible without killing keys and causing these marines to spawn in. You can find the letter M written on the ceiling out of bullet holes, a hidden easter egg from lead designer Jamie Greesimer as a gift to his girlfriend Meg. It even took a little bit before anyone discovered this easter egg, only after hints were dropped off on the Halo.Bungie forms. Most players won't ever see this easter egg themselves, but what about one that players aren't supposed to ever have gotten to really see? There are actually a handful of test maps used throughout the years from Bungie on the Halo franchise that were shown off in vidocs from behind the scenes, but were never meant or intended for players to actually get to see and play on. For instance, there's this one that's used just to test out the sound design and was used in Halo 3 and Halo Reach. There was this map that was like an outdoor coliseum, which also ended up being used in Halo 4 by 343 three industries, but was used in the previous Halos too. But eventually dev kits that had early prototype builds of Halo would leak online and some game preservationists were able to access these locations and share them online. Like for instance, Game Archivist's Galaxy on his YouTube channel has shown off both of these maps and explored them a bit. Similarly, in the alpha build of Halo Combat Evolved, the one that didn't make it into retail sales, on the level boarding action, if you jumped through this wall, you could find a shrine to some girl? We did a whole video on this a while back, but apparently it was a contractor at Bungie and the easter egg ended up getting removed before the game's full launch, but allegedly those two are married now, so that's neat. Still, very obviously, this was cut before the retail release of the game, so no one was ever supposed to find this. And then of course there's a secret room that players were supposed to find if they looked hard enough for it. At the very end of Bungie's tenure before moving on from Halo to start working on Destiny as an independent studio, to commemorate their stay with Halo, they hid an ultimate easter egg on the second to last level of Halo Reach. Once again, on Legendary Difficulty, you have to go and find the switch, then these elites will come running out, and if you sneak into the little room back there, you are teleported into this long hallway that essentially is the cutscene room where you meet up with Halsey. And inside there, there are a ton of tiny little Easter eggs referencing things that the community has done over the years, things that Bungie had done over the years, and just was kind of a cool love letter to send Halo off on one final bang. It was a really neat secret hidden in Halo Reach. Now let's shift gears and look at Call of Duty because overall with this franchise, for a long time, there wasn't too much known about the early prototype builds of these games. And only in recent years have those surfaced online where players were able to dig through the files and see what was in there. Sure, Call of Duty has a large history of Easter eggs and whatnot, but what about the things that players just weren't supposed to see at all? This is something that's found in a lot of the early development builds for Call of Duty, but specifically Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare and Modern Warfare 2 will be the two we're looking at. But YouTuber Nick Cool 290 one uploaded footage from the 32.8 developer build of COD 4 and the 482 build of Modern Warfare 2, both alpha builds of the game, that show off test areas used for firing ranges to test out the weapons. Now, shooting ranges in Call of Duty would later come to the games eventually, but this is unique because these were used by developers to test out the weapons. You can see a wide assortment of different weapons that you can use. In the Modern Warfare 2 build, they even used shipment, which wasn't in Modern Warfare 2 back in the day. And it's interesting that, for instance, the COD 4 one has this more tropical setting, which is likely leftover assets from Call of Duty 2, which is the same engine that Modern Warfare was built on. We'll leave a link down below to Nick Cool 2901s channel because he has other footage of previous Call of Duty games during their alpha phases. Like, you know, my personal favorite, Call of Duty World at War. Then over in Saints Row 4, there's actually a really interesting developer's room. Over inside of this store, you can see a sign that says employees only, but if you shoot the door, this hallway will open up, which you can then run inside the hallway and take a look around at this interesting room. You'll notice pictures of developers all over the place from Volition, rest in peace that studio. And there's even this weird floaty toy over here that apparently our editor said we can't show on YouTube. Still a pretty clever homage here that the developers hid in Saints Row 4. Then over in Cyberpunk 
7, there's actually a really unique developer room unlike any of the ones we've seen so far. If you head over to Kabuki, there's this alleyway where you'll see a vision of Johnny Silverhand show up to discuss something, and he essentially wants you to go into this room, but you'll find that the room is locked, and you need to have a passcode to open up the door. Now, to enter this room, you have to enter the numbers 605185, but how would anybody have even figured that out? Well, all the way back when Cyberpunk released, if you bought a physical copy of the game, there was this little leaflet pamphlet that came in the retail versions of the game, and here in the bottom corner of one of them, there's a serial code with these six numbers, and I guess you're just supposed to use these numbers here and know to do that. Nonetheless, if you open up the room, you can see this cool little section that's pretty unique to a lot of the interiors we see in this game. You can see Johnny Silverhand kick back and play a tune on his guitar, which is pretty cool. And then on the screen, pictures of developers will start to appear in a loop. And I don't know what it is, but whenever there's like actual pictures of real developers in games, there's always just something a little uncanny about it. And I just love this Easter egg specifically because of the odd nature of seeing real people here, obviously, but also the fact that it was hidden away so carefully. It's a pretty neat room to get to take a look at. Then there's developer rooms that sometimes developers get so mad that people find it, they'll ban players for it. And Fallout 76 is the prime example we're looking at for this one. Now, back when Fallout 76 released, the game was in a pretty rough state. It was riddled with a ton of bugs and glitches, more so than an average Bethesda release. And there was, of course, criticisms about the gameplay as well. Now, of course, this game is an always online game with looting and weapons supposed to be an objective that you grind for and whatnot and the main purpose of the game. This game also was serving as a live service game unlike the regular single player story modes that are released. However, for the last decade, every Bethesda game had a special secret developer room that had every weapon and armor in the game that was used for testing purposes and this was common knowledge amongst Bethesda players. However, some players modded in command consoles into Fallout 76 which as an online game is a no-no and they used very standard warp commands to warp into this test room and obtain all of the loot and weapons that were available there, essentially breaking the gameplay loop and economy that Bethesda was trying to make with Fallout 76. So in return for players who traveled there, there were instant bans being handed out, which kind of got a mixed response. Some players thought that was fair because it's unfair for players in a multiplayer game to cheat their way into having the best gear right away. But to other players who are used to games like Fallout 4 and Skyrim always being a modded adventure you could do whatever you want on. It did seem a little out of place for Fallout 76 to have that knee-jerk reaction to go straight for the ban. I lean more on the side that it makes sense that players got banned because it was that online game, but I also understand every previous Bethesda title had these rooms in it. Like, let's look. Fallout 4, if you typed in the command line, COC QA smoke for quality assurance, you would get into the Fallout 4 test room with all the weapons and items you could get. Back in Fallout 3, if you did test QA item, you would get a similar location in Fallout 3. Skyrim used the same one as Fallout 4 with the COC QA smoke command, where you could test all the items here as well and take them back with you technically if you wanted to. Oblivion even had it, except its command was COC testing hall. And all the way back with Morrowind, there was a room like this as well. This time the command was Todd test, likely named after our Lord and Savior Todd Howard. And then of course, Starfield, the newest Bethesda game, the first new world in 25 years. If you type in in the command thing, COC QA smoke, you get the test room in Starfield too. These are staples of the Bethesda universe, so I don't know, maybe they shouldn't have just had the room available when Fallout 76 released because they knew players would obviously look for it. I don't know. Dying Light 2 went an interesting route with their developer room doing a secret Easter egg. Essentially, if you've completed up through the VNC tower, you have to make your way to the top of the building and you can jump and fly to this other building across from it. If you then grab this cable from the room, rooftop and drop down a few floors to this other room. You can plug the cable in. Then you grab another cable and you have to drop down some more and plug that in. Then you grab another cable and you jump down this other side and you attach the cable. And then from there, there's a door you can open and boom, you're in an interesting developer room. There's a ton of references to other games the studios worked on like Call of Juarez amongst others. There's a charm you can get that gives you plus 500 weapon durability, which is like the highest thing in the game for just sitting in 
four different spots in order to get it. And there's a ton of little nods and Easter eggs in this room as well. Like if you sit by this teddy bear, more teddy bears will spawn in. Wow. Sometimes the secrets in older games can be really interesting too. Like for instance, in the Nintendo 64 game GoldenEye, there was this island way out in the distance that so many players, myself as a kid included, thought was some secret location that we had to access. It looked detailed enough, but it was so far away, nobody ever discovered an actual way to get over there. Now, it's assumed today that this area was a part of the level that ended up getting cut altogether, but was for at least a little bit structured and just was left behind. But I'd like to think that so many people theorized back then that this area was some super secret dev room, better than all of the rest, that had everything of anything in a whole nother campaign attached to it, obviously, because that's how rumors worked back in those days. But yeah, years later, players would be able to mod the game and travel out there to see what it's like, and it's just like a little island. There's nothing really going on here, but uh, yeah, no secret dev room here. But there were secret dev rooms in other older games from the Nintendo 64 era, like Donkey Kong 64, which this one's even more peculiar because to this date, nobody really knows for sure what's going on with this room. In the game, if you collect all 40 blueprints and you take them to Snide's headquarters and have that all completed, when you're looking at the blueprints, if you press up on the C stick, where normally you go to a bonus game menu and then press A and B at the same time, instead of starting a bonus game, the game will actually warp you into a secret room that likely was used to test the game mechanics. Now, there's really not too much going on in this room. It's eerily enough in the void, and there's this model of Donkey Kong here. He's just hanging out, I guess. There's been a lot of speculation as to what is going on here. Was this a room intentionally made for developers to test things? Well, yes and no. I don't think this version of the room was a test room used in later stages of development. However, it may have been a location in the game from the earliest stages of development when things were first being built out that remained in the game files and then by activating a glitch by pressing those button combinations at Snide's headquarters, you end up accidentally getting warped to this location that's not intended for players to use. The one creepy thing though is once you've entered this location, the only way out is to turn off your Nintendo 64 and restart your game over again. It's still one of the more unsettling locations in this video. There's also something interesting when it comes to this little game known as Animal Crossing. But there's an entire debug world or developer town, I guess, saved onto the game that can be accessed by using a controller plugged into the second slot on a GameCube and entering a combination of buttons. Doing this will spawn you in a location that was used during the development stages to test out a lot of the features in this game. But the weird thing is this town isn't quite normal. There's a lot of odds and ends about this town that don't look the way that the game normally has things looking like, and a lot of unused features will show up here as well. It's kind of a wild ride to watch someone run through one of these towns. And of course, in the context of knowing why these exist, it's not as weird, but if you were a kid and just stumbled across this, imagine how terrified you must have been thinking that your town somehow turned into this. Also, if you didn't know, I, I've been kind of side hustling an Animal Crossing channel for like a year. I have like 40,000 subscribers over there. So if you like Animal Crossing, uh, make sure you subscribe. But if you don't like Animal Crossing, uh, just, just stay here and subscribe to Rocket Sloth instead. And then of course in the game Unreal 2, The Awakening, if you're playing on the level Hell Desolation, after the starting room, you can find a room that has some crates over here. And if you make your way over the crates and pass them, you can go into this little cave-like hallway and you'll see a photo of someone being just projected there. I feel like this game's often forgotten about, but yeah, this exists. Also, just a side note, in this game, on the level Severnaya Waterfront, if you use a sniper rifle and aim it over on top of this antenna, there's a rotating Abraham Lincoln head. Yeah, I don't know, Unreal 2 is a weird time. Interestingly enough, the game Metro actually did a little section for a developer room, but this time it was the developer DLC, and I think this one was more obviously meant to be a playground for players to go and explore, but it's still cool to see something in the more traditional sense of a developer room where a lot of the weapons and stuff once again, much like the Bethesda games, are available for players to try out and use. This might be something from well beyond some of your guys' time, but if you played on the N64 way back in the day or the PC port of the South Park first person shooter game that existed, on the level 3-3 over on the cliff side on the far left side of this area, kind of behind this building, you can actually go right through the wall and discover this weird tunnel of sorts. 
but then there's this wall kind of blocking off the tunnel from going any further. Now, what we didn't realize is if you jump on top of these cargo boxes and pick up the invincibility and then jump back to where that entrance is and reclip through the wall, the wall will then be open this time around, allowing you access to this big, creepy cave with not too much going on in it, but you'll notice over here there are these piles of dirt, maybe, or something, shaped out in the letters CL, which is speculated to be the initials of Chuck Lupper, who was a level designer for the game. Also, huge shout out to Earth is Chillin' for documenting this Easter egg years later. Does anyone else remember the game Just Cause 4? This one's unique because it looks like this game had a, once again, secret developer room that may have been left in the game this time accidentally and not, you know, hidden in a specific way or cut before the game's release. If you head to the northernmost section of the map, just outside of the render distance, there is a structure that likely was forgotten when the game actually released that was used to test out different objects. Some fans speculate that it was used to test out lighting reflections, but nonetheless, while this likely was supposed to be cut from the game prior to its launch, it was left in the game. Honestly, if you don't know what you're looking for, you wouldn't find it, but you just have to fly with the wingsuit like out in a random direction in the ocean until essentially you see the structure and you can just go over there and land on it. As for what is available here, well, there's not really too much to do. There's some trees, some objects that obviously have some reflections on it that they were likely testing stuff with. But hey, you know, as a fan of these things, it's always cool to see something like this, especially in a game like Just Cause 4. A few years back, the game Mad Max released, and this one was really interesting because there was a secret development room hidden in this game, but it wasn't an area that players were supposed to be able to access and is only accessible by either using a cheat engine or being very careful utilizing out of bounds locations and glitches. But nonetheless, if you go way out of bounds into an area known as the big nothing, you can run into this development test area, which essentially doesn't have anything for vehicle stuff, just like on foot combat and whatnot, and a lot of buttons that can spawn in enemies and essentially just a little spot where you can fight some guys. And I mean, that's kind of cool. You can tell that this obviously was a development test area considering there's no textures on the walls and you can still see it's just a blocked out section, but it's always interesting how these little things slip through the cracks when a game is being developed and boom, all of a sudden players are able to find them sometimes years later. This next one, we didn't know if we should even count it on this list, but how could we not? Pokemon Red and Blue. Now there's two specific areas we're gonna talk about. The first one isn't really a developer room as much as it's, I guess, well, a literal developer room, but if you head to Celadon City, you can actually go into that big four floored building where you get Eevee in the early games. These are known as the Celadon Condominiums or Celadon Mansion, depending on what generation game you're playing. But this essentially is the Game Freak, the developers of the game's literal development room. And they'll even talk about how they're the ones making the game and programming the Pokemon games. I think these references are literal, but neat. But then if you want to go into an area that players aren't supposed to go, we could talk about Glitch City. It's not really a room, but an entire city that is just like corrupted game file data that game developers definitely didn't expect players to access or get to. This most commonly accessed through Pokemon Yellow essentially involves you doing a series of steps in the Safari Zone where you have to enter, then attempt to leave, but then say that you don't want to leave, then save and quit. And then when you try to enter again, they'll ask if you want to join a game where you have to say no. You then leave and then you walk out essentially a step clock that exists in the game for 500 steps, which is when it would normally tell you that your Safari Zone game is over. The typical PA will go off and then it will warp players what it thinks is back to the Safari Zone, but instead it's in this mess of a location. I don't know. Glitch City never made any sense, but it wasn't a real city and it wasn't a location players were supposed to get to, but it is an area of just jumbled up data, I guess is the best way to explain it. This is pretty neat to look at, but back in the day, the rumors on the playgrounds surrounding Glitch City were unlike anything else. Kids would talk about how this made their game actually haunted or that they found Mew 3 over there or that they found an entire new game that hadn't even been created yet that now they could play on their game somehow, but when they tried to show it to anyone, it would glitch out again and just play like a normal Pokemon game. To be honest, when I was a kid, this glitch had way too many steps for me to be able to follow and figure out how to do it correctly, but still, it's always been an interesting location that's existed in these Pokemon games. In the game Shadow Warrior 2, there's another really interesting one here. If you go into the Wang Cave and head over to this drum set, you can find this little area behind it, and then there's this wall that you can walk through. Yeah, you just go right through that thing. If you follow the pathway through a bit, you'll realize that, yes, you're obviously in an Easter egg room, and there's a lot of references 
references to other video games, other media, and it's a pretty nice place to just stop along the way. There's of course this picture of all of the developers just right there for you to see. And yeah, I'm a pretty big fan of this one overall. In Serious Sam the Second Encounter, there is this one Easter egg that I guess counts as a developer room, but it spans more than just a single room. But it's this terrifying developer encounter, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what's going on here. In the classic game Max Payne, if you manage to beat the game all the way through on the hardest difficulty, after completing the game, you'll get a special ending to the game that takes you to this interesting location. It looks like a museum, but once you wander the museum enough, you'll uncover something quite unique. There's a lot of interesting pictures. They almost look like just JPEGs slapped on some of these frames. But then there's this picture here of the team that worked on the first Max Payne game. Now, of course, these are just a few of the tons and tons of secret rooms that developers have hidden in their games. Would you guys like us to do another version of this one day in the future? There's a lot of other little locations that kind of just show up that you can run into, like both Borderlands 3 has DLC that has a dev room in it, and the Tiny Tina's Wonderlands game has a secret developer room that's also kind of worth noting. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, make sure you're subscribed with notifications on, or at least double check that you're subscribed because you don't want to miss our videos and a lot of times our videos just pop up on your home feed but you need to double check that you actually have that subscription pressed so you'll always see our content when we put it out huge shout out to our patrons for supporting our channel and making this content possible if you've been watching us for a while you got a few dollars burning a hole in your pocket why don't you throw them our way and become a producer with your name in the credits like this otherwise thanks so much for watching we'll see you next time with a new video